new here with your next instalment. First though, let's have a little recap about what you learned from Mrs Beard's section. So Lomas, a doctor, and Blackwood, the leader of Revelation, have been discussing the fact that Cillian had no injuries after the explosion. They found it a bit strange. And that also he's got no history of an illness or an accident that's resulted in him being hurt. Cillian also went to see Haley, his late father's boss, and he's suspicious of her because she wants to access his apartment to see whether he's left any medical records there. Cillian also met with his late father's lawyer and he also felt uneasy and suspicious towards him too. Cillian returned to his apartment to find an intruder. He was hit on the head and the intruder made off. Cillian wasn't disabled by the injury though and gave chase but he managed to escape. The intruder managed to escape. Okay, so that's where we were at the end of Mrs. Beard's section. So I'm going to pick up from chapter 18. Okay. And we're back with Tess. Tess stepped off the trap at Cotton Wharf and shivered. Nothing had changed. Stylish apartments converted from 19th century warehouses still lined the dock. Massive loading cranes, remnants of a grand industrial past, now turned into street furniture, were still twinkling with winter lights. And yet everything had changed. Two days ago, Tess had walked away from here as an agitator, a dissident. Now she was returning as a killer. The pulse bomb had blown away all her fuzzy thinking. As the smoke of shock cleared, she understood that her life would only make sense if she accepted that she was now a stormtrooper for the faith until the day she died. She walked briskly towards an old tea warehouse that had been turned into a private college. Institute for Cultural Studies was carved proudly above the huge steel doors. As she brushed past wealthy traders hurrying in, the opposite direction on their way to work, Tess couldn't help feeling that familiar twinge of resentment. Unlike most of these people who lived in Cotton Wharf, she had known poverty, what it smelt like, how it cut into your soul. When Tess had arrived in Foundation as an orphan and a refugee, she had been greeted with hostile indifference by a city that saw her as nothing but a burden. Foundation City helps those who help themselves was the proud civic boast. Well, if you couldn't, she remembered the series of placement homes with painful vividness, the humiliating catalogue of rejection, the adults who never had time, the tired clothes and crumpled shoes that were a constant reminder of your worthlessness. Until the moment when Blackwood had appeared from nowhere like a miracle, and given her a world that wasn't tenuous. He placed her in a school run by the faith, where people listened, where she woke up to the same faces that were there the previous night, where she learned to have hope again. That complete strangers would reach out and offer salvation had filled the nine-year-old Tess with such burning loyalty. She dedicated her life to the faith that had saved her. Eventually, she earned her place here. But the organisation that hid behind the facade of the Institute for Cultural Studies, Revelation. The moment Tess walked through the doors, she could feel the security cameras on her. This was no ordinary college. As Tess touched her hands on the fingerprint readers and looked into the iris scanner, she could feel the receptionist's gaze on her. Welcome back, Tess. Tess. Gone was the normal cool indifference. There was a respect in the receptionist's voice that Tess had never heard before. They're expecting you downstairs. Downstairs? That was a first too. Only the inner circle were allowed there. Do I need an access code? No, you're cleared now. Just touch the pads. Everything really had changed. The building was a brilliant mix of old and new. Underneath the roof with its massive iron girders was a large communal area where everyone ate together. 
lining the brick walls were glass cubicles. On the ground floor, these were briefing and preparation rooms. And on the upper floors, there were bedrooms where the students lived. As she walked along the central gantry, a girl of her own age with a crazy mass of curly hair hurried towards her. Tess, all anyone can talk about is you. Erin's voice was a mixture of admiration and disbelief. Are you going to a safe house for a while? I think they've got another assignment for me. Already? Tess glanced down into the dining area and saw the uneasy looks in the other students' eyes. She was no longer one of them. The Metro bomb had pushed her across some invisible threshold. I don't want to be late, Tess said, feeling suddenly uncomfortable. Sure, Erin stepped aside. I'll come and see you after. The strangeness followed Tess down into the vaulted basement, where Blackwood and five members of the Suprema were waiting. Tess only knew them by sight as they were too high up in Revelation to have any dealings with ordinary students. Yet now, each in turn stepped forward to embrace her. By the gift of the Creator, by the gift of the Creator, they whispered the words to her like a blessing, wrapping Tess in a cloak of heroism. Then they got down to the ruthless business of fighting for the faith. Chapter 19. Back with Cillian. Cillian had never seen so many people in the apartment. While one paramedic dressed his head wound, another filed the injury report. Beyond them, two uniformed police were questioning the security guard from the spire's cockpit, who had seen the chase on CCTV and called the emergency services. Over by the window wall, prying with professional deafness, was Pre Detective Quinn. You're certainly having a rough week, Quinn said, his curious eyes dancing around the room. First the metro, and now this. Cillian looked at him in disbelief, angry that he should be so flippant. I checked your records, Quinn went on, unperturbed. You've never been the victim of crime. Then, in a couple of days, what exactly are you saying? The timing's suspicious. How can you think they're related? You ever come across any radical groups at university? No. Cillian didn't try to hide his, his incredulity. What about religious factions? Right now I'm working on the rotational properties of five dimensional objects. Do you really think I'd have any interest in religion? By the attitude, I'm trying to help. Can't we do this another time? Now is good. Quinn waved the paramedics aside so that he could focus more intently on Cillian. You must have been hiding something in there. It was a professional job. He intruded knew exactly what security you had and how to get around it. He pointed to the electric box that one of the uniforms was removing from the main control unit. That disabler. We normally only see those in commercial espionage. I've got no idea what he was looking for. He didn't steal any tech? No. Valuables? No. You see anything obvious that's missing? Cillian glanced around the room, but everything seemed to be in its place. Don't you think that's strange? Quinn persisted. Lots of things are strange right now. Too many. Yeah, I certainly know that feeling. Quinn crossed the room and picked up a toolkit. He brought this with him, almost like he was planning to do some DIY. Cillian looked at the toolkit. Screwdrivers, spanners, a set of blades. It was the sort of thing that you could pick up in any hardware store. Ideas? I don't know. Cillian shook his head wearily. It doesn't make sense. Quinn drummed his fingers on the toolkit as he put it down. Have you always had a bad temper? What? I don't. Could have fooled me. Quinn picked up the cyber specs that were now sealed in a plastic evidence bag. You really went for him. Cillian felt suddenly uneasy as he realised that the whole encounter had been captured on the specs. 
Seems to me like he was searching, not stealing, Quinn said, until you interrupted. He touched the pad on the side of the specs. It's an ugly scene. Celine watched the video we played on the lenses. He saw his hand slamming the intruder into the wall, crushing his skull. It was sickening to see the look of violent rage on his own face. Wouldn't have marked you down as such an aggressive type, Quinn observed dryly. He was in my home. He could have had a knife. You didn't know. You just went for him. Math student becomes have a go hero. Quinn tossed the specs back onto the table. Almost as if you were trying to protect something. I was frightened. Quinn crouched down and gazed at him searchingly. What was he looking for? I wish I knew. Cillian put his head in his hands, struggling to think clearly, frustrated by all these events that refused to fit into a pattern. The doorbell rang and more officials filed in. It was going to be a long afternoon. Chapter 20 When the police finally left, Cillian clambered into the shower and turned everything on to full blast. The hot jets pummeled his body from all directions and he closed his eyes, lost in momentary, momentary oblivion. Without warning, he started to tremble. As the shock finally caught up with him, he gripped the shower head tightly, desperately trying to steady himself. If only his father was here, he would know, what, he would know how to handle this, what to do next. But Paul was dead. Dead? Yet refusing to completely die. Uncontrollable spasms suddenly racked Cillian's body, as if he was going to vomit up all of his insides. What was happening to him? Was he having some kind of breakdown? The alarming energy that had surged through his veins when he, was a, when he attacked the intruder, where had that come from? And worse, why had he enjoyed the dangerous feeling of power? Cillian forced himself to breathe deeply until the trembling passed. He flipped the jets from water to hot air to dry off and then, backed, and then walked back through the lounge. The victim support counsellor had left her card on the table. Was that what he needed, counselling? Well, was, was all this part of some strange post-traumatic stress? Maybe. But would opening up to a police counsellor just make him more vulnerable? He had the sense that Quinn knew more than he was saying, just like the doctor at the hospital. Something else was going on. Quinn was sure of it. Sorry, Cillian was sure of it. Forces were shifting beneath the glossy surface of everyday life, like those underground rivers that flow deep beneath the city, slithering past in the darkness. Cillian tossed the card back onto the table. He didn't need counselling. He needed things to fit into a pattern. Chapter 21 Everything we've learned about him has confirmed my suspicions, Blackwood said, as photos of Cillian appeared on the wall screen in the basement briefing room. He scrolled through numerous pictures plucked from social media. He's living proof that Foundation City has crossed a line. We must stop this abomination, one of the Suprema, a woman with heavy rimmed glasses pronounced. Tess looked at the pictures on the screen. Shouldn't we wait? Wait? Tess could hear the surprise in Blackwood's voice. Students never question the Suprema. To see if the city has learnt from the Metro attack, she went on. Now people know how serious we are shouldn't we give them ch time to change their minds when i reflected on his crimes and malice glasses quoted the frankenstein text by heart my hatred and revenge burst all bounds of moderation tess glanced at the rest of the suprema hoping for discussion rather than decree but no one was going to contradict glasses. The thing is, Blackwood said, striking a more pragmatic tone, with Cillian exposed, his controllers will want to pull him off the streets. So we have to work, work fast. 
For some time, we've known that an organisation called P8 has been funding radical research, incubating dangerous ideas. He turned and gazed at the picture of Cillian emerging from the smoke-filled station. This suggests they've gone way beyond that. Cillian could have died in that inferno, but he walked out unscathed. In Foundation City, everything has a price, but nothing has value anymore, Glasses said not even the human soul. Tess studied the photograph, willing herself to forget that she was the one who had put the grief on Cillian's face. I think he knows the value of the human soul. It's not just about him though, Blackwood looked searchingly at Tess. My fear is about Generation Zero. You have no proof of that, Glasses said impatiently. But it makes sense, Blackwood retorted. There's no point creating just one. Right now, we have to deal with what's in front of us, not wild theories. Glasses turned to Tess. You need to reach out to Cillian, win his trust, then use him to cut open the heart of P8. Haven't we shed enough blood, Tess said. It's because we're trying to stop blood being shed that you have to do this. Maybe, she, maybe you should choose one of the other operations, Tess said quietly. No. Blackwood crossed the room and sat down next to her. It has to be you. After everything that's happened, because of everything that's happened, you're upset, of course you are, which is why you need to see up close what we're really fighting against. Tess looked at the picture of Cillian holding his dying father. Don't underestimate him, Tess. There was a time when people killed each other just because of the colour of their skin. What PA are doing will divide humanity all over again. Only this time it'll be forever. People are sleepwalking into this and it's fallen to us to wake them up. 92, 93, 94. The pull-ups were really starting to hurt now, but Tess refused to stop. She had to keep going until all the doubts in her mind were quashed. The iron beam she gripped ran across the width of her room so she could look at the wall screen as she worked out. She'd selected images of Cillian to try to get into his mind, but there's something distant and unscrut unscrutable about him that was looking, that was locking her out. Maybe it was that his face was a little bit too symmetrical or maybe it was the strange, strange sense of composure that surrounded him, even in the middle of trauma. The only way in seemed to be through his eyes, which were flecked with vulnerability. Tess dropped to the floor, strapped some weights to her ankles. Vulnerable meant easy, if you could harden your heart. She leapt to do another 100 pull-ups, trammeling her mind, onto a single track, the mission. Okay, everyone, that's the end of today's instalment. But be sure to tune in next time and Mrs Cooper will be taking you through the next few steps of the story. Thank you.